or it means this or it means that. But the speaker of Bhagavad Gita knows what Bhagavad Gita is about and only the one who, who understands the speaker of Bhagavad Gita can present the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita as it is. So Srila Prabhupada used to say that there are so many editions of Bhagavad Gita, but how many people are actually surrendering to the Supreme Lord in devotional service? And that's the essence of Bhagavad Gita. As Krishna says in the very end of Bhagavad Gita, you know, forget about everything I told you and just surrender. <laughs> Not forget about it, but see it as inferior to the process of surrender. But what is surrender? Surrender means to follow the instructions of the Supreme Lord. That's what surrender means. And to interpret the instructions in order to fulfill one's own desires, which is very fashionable today, using Bhagavad Gita to facilitate one's political interests or one's family interests or one's personal interests. I remember, uh, this is quite common. In fact, it's very rare that Krishna is glorified as the Supreme Personality in Bhagavad Gita. I remember I came across a wonderful article describing the glories of Bhagavad Gita. This was many years ago in one magazine in the United States put out by a very religious society, the Theosophical Society, I believe it was, and glorifying the great words that are spoken by Gita in such as his poetic renditions and the very much the emphasis on its literary embellishments and the whole scene you know, described, but it doesn't, there was no conclusion to it. It was just a nice philosophical literary presentation. And who spoke at Krishna? Who's Krishna? Nobody knows. Or Krishna is whoever you want him to be. <laughs> and so, in that way, people sometimes use Bhagavad Gita for their own ends or do not understand what is the purpose of Bhagavad Gita. Um, and Krishna, pure devotee, can give us the understanding. That's why when Bhagavad Gita was put out by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, then people actually started to become devotees of Krishna, not only within the land of India, but all over the world. People were getting this Bhagavad Gita and understanding you know, what Krishna is actually saying, that you know, all living beings are my eternal parts and parcels. They're in me and they're mine, Krishna says. <laughs> and he says, when you know the truth, you will understand this principle, that everything is within me and everything is me. And your, and your relationship with me is one in devotional service. <laughs> so it takes one who is a pure devotee of the Lord, who is practicing the principles of Bhagavad Gita, who can explain Bhagavad Gita in such a way that it's clear. It's like when Prabhupada, when he first began his movement back in the America, he was using another sadhu, some saint's Bhagavad Gita. And he was giving his own interpretation. There's one verse... In the ninth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna says, Manmana Bhava Mad Bhaktam Mam Yaji Mam Namaskuru. Mam Evaisisik Sat. That's a different one. I'll get the exact verse. That's important. He says, Mam Evaisisi Yuktaivam Atmana Mad Parayanaha. Engage your mind always thinking of me. Become my devotee. Offer your obeisances to me and worship me, being completely absorbed in me, surely you will come to me. So Srila Prabhupada was speaking on this verse, and there was a commentary by someone else. And this commentary was saying, It is not to Krishna that you have to surrender, but it's the unborn, unmanifested aspect within Krishna. So. Srila Prabhupada became quite disturbed and says, just see, Krishna is saying surrender to me and he's saying don't surrender to Krishna. 
or some, he's giving a different explanation of what, what Krishna is. He's something else than his transcendental form. Or making a dis- distinction between Krishna's body and Krishna. Krishna's body is spiritual and there's no difference between Krishna's body and his body. Between Krishna's body and himself. But we, we are different than our body. That is what the S, that's what Bhagavad teach, Gita teaches. So Arjuna, he's being put into illusion in order so we can hear this great knowledge in a very systematic way. He doesn't want to fight. He looks on the other side. He sees his well-wishers, his friends, his grandfather, his teachers, people who he grew up with. He becomes overwhelmed with material compassion and starts to give reasons why he shouldn't perform his duty as a Kshatriya. Uh, Krishna listens to all his arguments and basically after he says, are you done speaking? And, you know, sometimes somebody wants to say something and it's all full of nonsense. So you become patient and you listen to it. And then when they're done, you say, are you done? Is there any more nonsense you want to say before I speak? (laughs) And so Krishna was very patient listening to Arjuna's reason for why not to do his duty. And, it, you know, Arjuna is glorified in one sense for his reasons. And his reasons were very practical. His reasons were very philosophical. His reasons were based on what we say material compassion. Compassion for the body, not compassion for the soul. And what did he say? If we, even if we win the war... How can we enjoy the kingdom if it is gotten by the expense of the lives of people who are dear to us? They are our superiors. We have learned from them. We have associated with them. We We have affection for them. How would it be possible to consider winning the war a victory? Whether we win or lose, we lose. That was his argument. And he was also saying that, you know, these great personalities, they are the standard for religious principles. If they are killed, where where will religious, religious principles be begotten? They are teachers, they are gurus. He went on to say that, and in the war, so many soldiers will be killed. And therefore, there will be no, what we say, protection for for the women class. And then exploitation will become prominent. And there will be Vanasankara, Vanasankara within society. And when Vanasankara comes, the whole society goes down. (laughs) So he had some very practical, very philosophical, very humanitarian arguments. But Krishna listened and said Asocham on the Sochams Twams Pachyavadam Chibasu say Gatasums Akudatum Shas Nandu Shochan Dipanditaha. my dear Arjun, you're speaking very nice learned words, but I must conclude you're a fool. Because they're all based on the body. <laughs> Has nothing to do with the soul or the reality. And then Krishna went on to speak A very simple, basic religious principle, which is the foundation of the principle of spirituality. And that is the difference between the body and the soul. He says, never was the time that I did not exist, nor you, nor are these kings, nor are in the future, so any of us cease to be. He gave an understanding for about 20 five verses or more, Krishna is explaining in a very systematic way the difference between the body and the soul. Or the difference between the individual and the place where the individual resides. This is basic spiritual knowledge. Unless we have this knowledge of the difference between our body and ourself, at least a theoretical understanding 
that we are not this body, then one cannot understand any other thing. Just like if you go to a mathematical class and you want to learn mathematics, you learn the very basics before you can learn the higher principles of math, such as algebra, trigonometry, calculus. You have to know basic math because these things are included in the higher principles. So in the same way, the basic knowledge of Bhagavad Gita is the difference between the body and the soul. And Krishna, practically in more than any section within the Gita, he really emphasizes this point. And then, after giving a clear understanding, he says, the hanyate hanyamane savire, the body dies, the soul lives on, um, and this, the soul is eternal, immortal, undying, primeval, it doesn't change when the body changes. At night you take off your clothes and the next day you put on a new set of clothes. And so life after life the soul is changing from one body to another. Just as the, just as the, as the, the uh, person is changing clothes from day to day. So many arguments on this point. He says the soul cannot be withered by the wind, nor burnt by fire, nor dried by air, nor wet by water. It, has, it cannot be affected by any material situation. The soul is pure. The soul is in the body, but still it doesn't come in contact with the body itself. So Krishna is giving very basic spiritual knowledge. And finally, after concluding that, he starts to change into another argument. You're a Kshatriya. You're a warrior. You're a hero. You're famous. If you fail to fight, you'll be criticized. You'll be defamed. How will you continue to maintain your life when, when you, he says, for those who are honored, dishonor is worse than death. Better to fight and die than to be dishonored and live a life of dishonor. So he talks about duty. And so Krishna is going through different arguments. And then he explains in the very beginning of Bhagavad Gita what is karma yoga, how by doing your duty in relationship to the Lord and offering the results of those activities in devotion, then that frees one from the desire to enjoy material life. It gives us a little foothold in, in the relationship between the Lord. This is called karma yoga. In the first six chapters, Krishna talks about mostly about karma yoga and a little bit about jnana yoga. He doesn't touch bhakti in the very beginning, although the essence of Gita is, is basically bhakti yoga. But in the very beginning, he's teaching how to renounce the desire to enjoy the material world. You like to do something? Okay, do it for Krishna. Give the results to Krishna. Yagnartha kamano yatra loko yam kamabandhanaha. He says, work done as a sacrifice for me must be performed. Otherwise, work binds one to the material world. Perform your duty for my satisfaction, and that way you'll be unattached and free from material bondage. So that is the beginning of the explanations of karma yoga. The difference between karma yoga and karma is karma attaches us to the desire that we can we are the enjoyer we're trying to enjoy the things of this world a little bit better is karma yoga where we can perform our activities and offer the re some of the results to krishna we become t detached from the results of our activities so there's a sense of renunciation that that it comes by way of this practice but these are only preliminary understandings of the teachings of bhagavad gita very preliminary and then he speaks about yoga, jnana yoga. Jnana yoga, is, he says, Bahunam jnana mamante, jnana mampam prapatyante, vasudeva sarvamiti, samahatma sadurlobhya. One can practice studying philosophical knowledge and detach themselves from all material activities and be situated in meditation upon the Supreme. 
and then gradually free oneself from all material activities. But it's still a feature of one's own self-interest that one is trying somehow or other to free themselves from material suffering. That's all. It's not about devotion to the Supreme, it's about freeing oneself from material suffering or material activities which cause suffering. Okay. So in the first six chapters, and Krishna in the sixth, in, in, in the sixth chapter, he gives really complete knowledge of the various yoga systems. And in the sixth chapter is called the, the, the Yoga Ladder. He talks about the mind, how to engage the mind in various ways, what is the nature of the mind, how to fix the mind on the Supreme, how to perform the various types of yoga systems. But then at the end of the sixth chapter, he says, Yoginam apisarvesham matgatendranat manaha stradava bhajate yomam teme yukta tamomataha. That there are so many yogis and they're performing various types of yoga. But who's the best of all yogis? One who surrenders to me in devotion. That's the bhakti yoga. And then, after explaining the different yogas and what is the highest of all yoga, in the seventh chapter he begins teaching a little bit about bhakti. And he explains what is bhakti. Bhakti means to fix your mind upon me in devotion. And this is a very... The seventh chapter, verse number one, Krishna explains what is the system of yoga. Or how to perform yoga. He says, Maya Shakta Mano Parta, Yoga Yunja Madasraya, Asamsayam Samagramam Nitajachani Tatschanu. Krishna says, Oh, now here, O son of Prita, Arjuna is the, is the son of Prita. His mother was Prita, Priti. And is how he, he refers to him as the son of Prita. She's a glorious personality, and so he's giving credit to Arjun for coming from a very wonderful family. How, by practicing yoga in full consciousness of me, with your mind fixed upon me, you can know me in full without any doubt. <laughs> so here is the beginning of Krishna speaking bhakti yoga, to fix your mind on Krishna. But how to fix the mind on Krishna? That's the process of yoga. And so that, that is explained throughout how to engage oneself in service of the Lord by acting for the benefit of the Lord or for the pleasure of the Lord. So throughout the Gita, Krishna is giving various types of processes. In the ninth chapter, he explains knowledge that is even more confidential, the knowledge of devotion. And then in the tenth chapter, he really gets into explaining who he is. He says, I'm the source of everything. Everything comes from me. There's nothing that is not anything you see or anything in existence, both spiritual and material. I am the source. He says, I am the source of everything. And one who knows that, they actually engage in glorifying me. He says that in the next verse. And one who glorifies me with devotion, I give them the knowledge by which they can come to me and ultimately uh, come to the full understanding of myself. I do it directly. So Krishna is explaining various aspects of knowledge. But what is the essence of all knowledge? That's explained in the 18th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. That there are so many, there's knowledge of Brahman, there's knowledge of super soul, but then the most confidential, the most highest of all knowledge is to actually be, to be a pure devotee of Krishna. <laughs> That's the essence of all knowledge. And Krishna says, he says, uh, and he says, thus I've explained to you more confidential knowledge. He doesn't tell Arjun, you surrender. He says, now I've given you everything. Now you 
try to understand what is the essence. He doesn't say, well, I'm God, and you're my servant, surrender. <laughs> he, he, you know, God can do that. <laughs> but he's, he's, he's using, he's explaining things in a very philosophical way to cater to the intelligence of the living entity. So one who is actually intelligent or understands the essence of Gita will understand what Krishna is saying. There are people who take Bhagavad Gita and they stop at a certain section and say, this is what Krishna wants. You know, karma yoga or jnana yoga or various types of other yogas or detaching oneself. You know, you can take Gita and you can pick whatever you like and then you can say, this is what Gita is about. <laughs> But if you systematically go through Gita, you'll see that ultimately in the end, Krishna, after giving all the various types of practices, he sums it up. And what does he sum it up in the verse number 64, 65, I'm saying. He says, okay, 64 actually. Because he says, because you are my very dear friend. Now, Krishna is not only speaking to Arjuna, he's speaking to all living entities. He says this in the fifth, fifth chapter, in the very 29th verse. Suhidam uh, sarvadehinam. That I am the friend of everyone. There are different types of friends. In this world, we have friends. We have, what we say, official friends, friends that we see, people we see from day to day, maybe in our work or in a day to day life. And then we have more intimate friends, close friends. We might even say confidential friends, people who are very close to us in a friendship relation. But then there is that friend who is the, fr who is the friend of everyone. And Krishna says, that's me. <laughs> Why am I? Why is he the best friend? Because he's giving us what we need. If someone is your friend, they'll do for you what is the best for you. And a friend is not a person. Like in this material world, people have friendships or relationships, not only in friendship, but in marriage, in any aspect of life. And as soon as one partner or someone fails to satisfy the senses of the other person, There is some, what we say, difficulty or some strain in the relationship. And if it continues, then the relationship breaks. Mm -hmm. That's material life. But Krishna, he can say, I am the friend of every all living entities because he knows what is best for each living entity. So in that Here he says, because you are my dear friend, I am speaking to you my supreme instruction, the most confidential knowledge of, he, of all. Hear this for me, for it is for your benefit. So he's, Krishna is not speaking for his benefit. He's speaking for our benefit. He's got a lot of things to do. <laughs> he can, he's in this spiritual world... He has his activities with his confidential associates. Therefore, he doesn't need to come to the material world and explain philosophical knowledge. <laughs> But he does it in order to uplift the conditioned souls to the platform of eternal truth. So he says, I'm speaking this for me. So here, in the purport... His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada, says, The Lord has given Arjuna knowledge that is confidential, that is knowledge, the difference between matter and spirit, and still more confidential, the knowledge of the super soul within the heart of all living, and God is in the heart. And now he is giving the most confidential part of knowledge, just surrender unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And then he teaches us how to surrender. When you say surrender, that doesn't really tell you much. 
But how to surrender, Krishna does. And therefore he says in the next verse, Manmana Bhava Madbhakto. This verse has been, this, these words have been repeated twice by Krishna throughout the Gita. In the ninth chapter, and again in this uh, 18th chapter. Mam Yaji Mam Namas Guru Mam Vivaishasi Satyam Te Patijana Priyosimi. He says, Always think of me, become my devotee, worship me, and offer your homage to me. Pur purport. The most confidential part of knowledge is that one should become a pure devotee and always think of the Lord and act for Him. One should not become an official meditator. <laughs> One, what does that mean to become an official meditator? That means to take up meditation as an occupation. <laughs> it's a good business to be an a good meditator. You know, just like you can be an accountant, you can be a lawyer, doctor, so many things. So you can be a meditator too. You get your degree in meditation <laughs> by reading scripture and acting in a way that appears to be. But here, it says, we should mold our life in such a way that one can remember Krishna throughout the day. So that is the highest type of confidential knowledge, to think of Krishna and to engage in the service of the Lord. And then in the next verse, he says, this verse is really misunderstood by many, even great commentators. The next verse, Sarva Dharma Pradikshit Yam, Mam Ekam Sharanam Vraja, Aham Tvam Sarva Papebhyo, Moksha Yishyami Ma Suchaha. He says, Abandon all varieties of religion and surrender to me. What does that mean? Give up religion. He doesn't say, he's not saying giving up the practice of spirituality. He's saying giving up all other activities of spiritual elevation, such as control of the senses, various types of meditation, study of scripture, chanting of mantras, so many various, what we say, activities that are part of the process of spiritual life. But when we practice these things as the goal, then they interfere with the real goal, which is to surrender. So the Lord explains that all these things are included in the process of surrender. As one surrenders to the Lord, all the activities that come by way of devotional service are included in the process of surrender. And one can... Nothing is lost when one surrenders. And what is surrender? In this age, surrender is easy. You don't have to go to some secluded place and perform some great austerities and uh, sit in meditation. Or you don't have to take sannyas, complete renunciation of all material activities. All you have to do is to chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> or to make chanting the holy names of the Lord as the means for remembering Krishna in this age. We come and see the deity. We take darshan of the deity. But can we actually see Krishna in his deity form? When we take darshan, are we seeing Krishna? Or are we seeing something that resembles Krishna? <laughs> To see Krishna, one has to see Krishna first with the ears before one can see with the eyes. The ears have to be, what we say, purified. The heart has to be purified with, through transcendental sound vibration. And as that purification, what we say, develops, then the coverings of the material energy which block our understanding of the Krishna become gradually destroyed like that. And then Krishna reveals himself in his form as a deity when our mind and hearts become pure. So darshan actually really means to let Krishna see you. <laughs> when you take darshan, that's what it means. 
that I have to present myself in front of Krishna in such a way that he wants to see me. That's real darshan. Not like, let me see Krishna. What are you going to see? You can see something. But some people see stone or wood. Some people see nice decorations. Some see people see a little something. But Krishna is there performing his transcendental pastimes. Can we actually see that? It's possible. When the mind and has become, what we say, fully purified through the process of hearing about Krishna and through engaging in his devotional service. So the Lord reveals himself through the process of devotion. And that begins, develops, and reaches its perfection in this age by chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Ram, Dham Dham, Hare Hare. Yena Kena Pakarena Mana Krishna Divesaya. Somehow or other bring the, the, the remembrance of Krishna into the mind. Somehow or other remember Krishna. When things are going nicely or according to our plans, the tendency is to forget. And then when some, something goes wrong or we're in some danger or some calamity, then, oh, Krishna help, right? We call out Krishna when we want him to solve our problems, right? Or to readjust the material energy so it's not giving us a, too much trouble. <laughs> that is modern day, what we say, understanding of spiritual practice. But one should know, truly, that one is always in a dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. This material world is a very precarious place. Padam padam ya padam natesham. That there's danger at every step. We don't have to go into the details of what could happen or what does happen, but we know that there is what this material world is based on is fear and uncertainty. No one can be certain of the future. Everyone is fearful of losing or not gaining. That's the nature of this world. So, in that situation, one has to take shelter of something. Mm -hmm. And to take shelter of anything in this material world means to try to cross the ocean by getting in a boat made out of stone. <laughs> it's going to sink. <laughs> because these boats that are made out of stone are part of the same thing that we're trying to get free of. <laughs> We're trying to get free of the uncertainty, and everything in this world is uncertain, or cannot give real shelter. But one who takes shelter of Krishna by engaging in devotional service and chanting his holy name, that's why Bhagavad Gita is here. It's to systematically teach us, very carefully going through the various aspects of devotional life, the different types of yogas, the different types of spiritual practices, coming to the supreme and ultimate principle. The supreme and ultimate principle is the only principle that can satisfy the soul. Karma yoga, you get detachment. But what's the use of detachment if you're not attached to something better? Jnana yoga, you get some knowledge between the difference of matter and spirit. And it helps you free you from some material suffering. But that's also temporary. It doesn't bring us to the perfectional stage of life. Only bhakti. Bhakti is pure. Bhakti is not something that is of this nature of the material world. Karma and Gyan still have material principles. Karmis want to enjoy senses, the jnanis want to enjoy the mind, the yogis want to be powerful by performing mystic feats and magic and manipulating the material energy. But the bhaktas, the devotees, what do they want? They want to serve Krishna, that's all. Or they want to serve Krishna for Krishna's pleasure. Knowing that by serving Krishna, that is the perfection. Why? Because we are part and parcel of Krishna. That's taught in the very beginning of the Bhagavad Gita. 
So one doesn't have to endeavor separately for one's self-interest other than to engage in devotional service to the Lord. So this, this Bhagavad Gita is not some simple explanation of different types of yogas. It's not meant to simply be given as a gift to your friends because it's the time of the year to do that. <laughs> it's meant to be understood as the way to live life. <laughs> it's, the, it's the road map from going to where you are to where you should be. <laughs> it's how to reach perfection of life. And Krishna speaks it very systematically, very understandably. But even though it's so simple, still people apply their own interpretations. Therefore, unless one has a pure devotee to explain Bhagavad Gita clearly, one can, what we say, speculate. And therefore, that's why there are so many versions of Gita. Uh, at least 30 years ago, there were 664 versions back in the 1970s. I think maybe a few more versions have come out since then. <laughs> so there are 700 verses in the Bhagavad Gita. Probably there are 700 different versions of Bhagavad Gita. So... It's not something, it's not like Bhagavad Gita as I think it should be, or Bhagavad Gita as what I want it to be. Bhagavad Gita as it is, that's why Siddha Prabhupada presented it the way Krishna wanted it to be presented. And Bhagavad Gita, although it teaches what we say, the three aspects of life, what are the three aspects of life? That is, to meet Krishna, to serve Krishna, and to develop your relationship in loving service to Krishna, or the goal of life, like that. But Bhagavad Gita is simply, what we might say, preliminary understanding of spiritual life. Without, without understanding Bhagavad Gita, or the principles that govern Bhagavad Gita, the higher aspects of Krishna's personality his intimate relationship with his devotee. Krishna doesn't speak about Radharani, nor his pastimes in the spiritual world in Bhagavad Gita. He's introducing himself as God, that's all. Just like you may meet a very important person, and then you know his credentials, you may know his occupation, and you may know where he lives, like that. But he's, he doesn't tell you about what he does in his private life. That comes later. That's in Srimad Bhagavatam. Krishna's personal life, his, his pastimes in the spiritual world with his devotees in a very loving and intimate way. That comes later. Therefore, Krishna ends Bhagavad Gita with the principle of surrender. So, in under, just like if you meet a big person, unless he likes you, he's not going to tell you about you know, his joking around with his wife. <laughs> He's not going to tell you about his intimate, loving relationships with his friends. He's just going to be very official. But the more you become his confidential friend, the more he reveals more about his own life like that. And so Bhagavad Gita is preliminary knowledge. But it's, it's complete in itself because all the aspects of the Supreme and the relationship with us are there within the Gita. But the higher aspects of spiritual practice such as the sweetness of pure devotional service that comes with serving Krishna in the various mellows of friendship and parental affection and ultimately in conjugal love you don't find any of that in Gita that's only in Srimad Bhagavatam and in Chaitanya Charitamrita so Prabhupada used to say Bhagavad Gita is high school <laughs> It's high school. Srimad Bhagavatam is university, and Chaitanya Charitamrita is postgraduate study. <laughs> and so there are different levels of spiritual knowledge being presented according to what level of practice you are. Therefore, as you go to school and you go through the different grades, and gradually you become qualified for the next subject matter to learn. 
some a, a complete or at least a preliminary understanding of the essence of Bhagavad Gita is required before we can understand Krishna in Vrindavan mm -hmm. and his transcendental pastimes. And so this this book is practically the most important explanation of the relationship between the Supreme and the living entities. Very systematic. Everything is here in terms of that understanding. And then the essence, of course, in the very last verse, it says, what is the power of this scripture? Wherever there is Krishna, the master of all mystics, and wherever there is Arjuna, the supreme archer, that means wherever there is God and his pure devotee, what, what is there? There is opulence, victory, extraordinary power, and morality. That is the last verse spoken not by Krishna, not by Arjuna, but by Sanjay, who is speaking this treatise on the battlefield to, not on the battlefield, but seeing the battlefield from a distance to his uncle, Dhritarashtra. And so, this is... This is Bhagavad Gita. So we should take the opportunity not only to learn this great knowledge, but to distribute it also. Mm -hmm.